So um, the digital divide research area has been around for quite a while and it started with concerns about people's access to um, computers. And so I'm going to give a little brief background about the digital divide and how it's related to issues of inequality. And then these are the other topics. Uh, very briefly, I'm going to report some studies that we've done in the U.S. with uh, Jim and some others. And then also a variety of studies we've done in the Caucasus, which are three countries uh, right smack in the middle of um, sort of Eastern Europe. And uh, just talk about some of the factors that affect this digital divide, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. And the general theme or the general story behind this presentation is extending the model di digital divide research. So it started out pretty simple, and we're finding out that there's lots of pieces to this puzzle, and we're able to, to do some kinds of studies to extend <coughs> that. All right. Um, and one of the ways of extending this is by various factors that influence the ability to access uh, the internet, uh, demographics, language, um, two different kinds of uh, technologies that you might adopt, and then also the relationship between them and how they might be used and what factors influence that, um, how those things then influence online, online activities because the kinds of things that you do on the internet affect what kind of benefits or outcomes that you get from it, and is there a difference in the things that influence the activities you do so that it looks like you're using the internet, but some people actually don't get as much benefit as others. And then um, we have a very interesting study, well, it's for you to decide whether it's interesting, um, over time analysis of the diffusion of mobile phones, and then we can add on to the digital dif divide model with the diffusion model. So in your classes, have you studied yet the diffusion of innovations model? No? So we have one. OK, I only need one. I feel, ah, oh, OK, so it exists. And so we'll return back to the concept of, uh, this concept of multiple divides. So um, initially, this was a great concern of the US government about whether people have equal access to computers, because the same argument can be for computers. Early on, uh, computers were expensive and complicated, and people who didn't have access to them were being left behind. So there was the term probably you've heard, the information haves and the information have-nots. And so that came from that period as well. It also relates to telephone policy. So you all have mobile phones now, but before mobile phones you had land phones. And 94 95% of the US population had land phones, not so much anymore. And that was a result of US policy in the early 1900s, 1930, 1940, saying really people should have universal access. The telephone system should be available to everybody because it's important for crisis, it's important for health, it's important for community development. So they had a policy whereby they wanted everybody to have access to the phones, and that's kind of carried over into the computer world. And a couple of the benefits are, I mean, there's many, many, but just two summaries. One is the access to these communication devices and information devices increase your human and social capital. So for instance, you all have friends here, you belong to different networks. Some of those people will be friends of yours as you leave college and go to different places. You'll be able to contact them through your alumni networks. Maybe you can get a job from them or maybe offer them a job or start up a company or go on vacation with them. That's social capital. Your development of that social capital is is great resource for you to help you in your neighborhood, to extend your life, to be better. And these uh, communication devices are useful in, ex in extending and increasing your social capital. So people who don't have access to that social capital are going to have a much more impoverished kind of life. And also another increasing uh, uh, focus is on civic participation. If people have access to information about politics, about economics, about uh, issues related to your community or society, you can be a more informed citizen. You can actually engage in debate and discussion. You can be more aware of what's going on, and therefore your voting would be more informed, and that's what's important in a democracy. It's not control from a king or whatever. You're in control, but that only works if you're informed. So it's very important that people have access to information and they can talk about it so that you can participate in civic activity, vote, other kinds of activities, and that's what makes democracy work. And of course, there's tons of research on all that kind of stuff. Um, 
so actually there's been quite a lot of research on digital divide and, and what's interesting is the very first article was published that mentioned this as a like, title or an abstract. It was in 1989 and it was in a journal um, called the Electronic Librarian. So librarians were very interested in these issues because their whole purpose is to make information accessible to people through libraries and then through online systems and databases. So here's kind of a plot of citations over the years. The last couple of years declined because it takes a while for these articles to be cited, but it, it took off and it's been pretty consistent. If you go to Google Scholar, you get 122,000 entries. So a lot of people are interested in this stuff. All right, so this part here is kind of standard academic research. What are the factors or influences on digital divide? That is, whether you have access to computer or now the internet or other things or not. That's the simplest definition. You have, it, have you adopted it or not? And these are the kinds of things that are shown through the literature to affect that. So early on there was a gender divide. So men were more likely <coughs> to adopt technologies than women. In the internet, that's not the case in the US, but it's still a case in many other countries. But other factors like race, education, income, uh, employment, whether you live in a city or rural area, other use, um, the motivations or skills, uh, and then more macro factors like uh, telecommunication policy, which is different in the U.S. from other countries. So in other countries, there's differential use of mobile phones or computers, partially because the policy is different, different pricing mechanisms, different entrance to the marketplace, different controls over information. So if you're interested in those issues and you want to do cross-cultural comparison, it's a great field. Okay, so two, we're already beginning part two out of seven, so there's high hopes we'll finish. I want to give a little quick background. Uh, Jim was very kind when I uh, joined the faculty at Rutgers to ask me and uh, join him in uh, analyzing a variety of really good national probability samples. And these were some of the very first, and certainly some of the very first representative samples of internet use from 1995 up through 2000. And uh, we worked together in a book that came out, Social Consequences of Internet Use. So we have data from that. Now, oh, better answer that. <laughs> um, the Pew Foundation, the Pew uh, uh, Project on American, uh, American Internet, uh, Internet and American Life Project, they have great survey data. It's available online. You can even download the data and analyze it. And they just had a report that was uh, announced just yesterday about um, decreasing digital divide according to age. Another source of data that I'll refer to here, and this is very strange, we have nationally representative samples from Caucasian countries, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Has anybody ever been to any of those countries? Is anybody Armenian in descent? Do you know what Armenia is? <laughs> it's not, it's a very obscure country unless you know about it, and it has a really, really rich history. And all these countries that are grouped together, I'll show you what they're like. And my um, former doctoral student now at the University of Washington, Katie Pierce, and I have worked on a variety of projects using nationally representative samples from these countries. <coughs> they provide a very different context, so you can actually find out different interesting things. One of them is, the pointer here. Yay. Oops. The, um, the Armenian the former Soviet republics are very interesting is that they, they had very good educational systems. They have very high literacy, but they have really, really bad poverty. And that's unusual. A lot of the countries we look at have a mix, and so this actually makes things more extreme. You might find some new kinds of things. Here are our favorite countries. Here's Georgia, here's Armenia, here's Azerbaijan, and you've probably read about Crimea recently, right? with the Ukraine and Crimea has been annexed, taken over, willingly joined Russia, depending on how you look at it. So it's very close to that. And this whole area has unbelievable history, really ancient, very interesting history. OK, so one of the influences relevant to these countries is language. So for instance, here's the Armenian script. It's not based upon Latin. It's actually a very, very unique, distinct uh, language group, not even group. So Finland, I've been in Finnish, in Finland, and they also have completely unique language. It's not related to anything else. They don't know where it came from. But in this particular case, they use this very weird script. It can be 
uh, a little bit. But if you speak Armenian, it's very difficult to get content from the internet because you have to primarily be able to type in English. Now, other languages have interfaces as long as they can be translated to keyboard. This can't really be easily translated to keyboard. And on mobile phones, you have to have a mobile phone with a legal operating license to be able to download the relevant language interface. And if you've gotten uh, black market phones, you know the operating system, you can't actually download the Armenian interface. So language is quite a barrier. We're fortunate that it's not a barrier for us. So that's a little background on language. So what does the literature say on, um, on demographics? Well, there's a very consistent range of, of variables. We've talked about some of those. And we've seen that language and English skills and other factor. Now, one of the first sort of extensions of the digital divide is, remember earlier, it was just adoption. Have you adopted the internet? Have you used the internet? But we begin to find out that there's many other things. First of all, there's awareness. There's a lot of people who at the time, certainly in 1995, were not aware of the internet. So if you're not aware, you can't possibly have adopted it. Another interesting thing is other factors like um, race or um, ethnicity, and in some cases, income. Um, once you control for awareness, those divides tended to, to diminish, which meant that there was a high correlation between awareness and your demographic condition. So if you're really poor, certain subgroups, you weren't even aware of the internet, and that's why you didn't adopt it. Once I controlled for that, then maybe you, know, you had as much chance as anybody else. One of the things I'm going to talk about here is the extension. There you go. The extension to devices. So the original research was based upon a PC, well, not even a PC, but a computer. And so that's fixed. You've got to have a telephone line, which meant you have dial up, have a modem. It's complicated. The early PCs were complicated. I actually um, was a systems analyst before I went to grad school. And the first time, I mean, I used to do programs with cards. The first time I saw a terminal where you could enter your data on the terminal, it was like Star Wars. It was like, whoa. The, the consultant took me to the back room and wanted to show me off this new device. It was like glowing. It was really amazing. And I had one of the very first laptop computers, the old compact portables. Unless you do weights, it's really not portable. It looks exactly the same size as a sewing machine. Um, but they were very important. After you've actually started using it, uh, there's different kinds of uses. There's how frequently you use it, how long you've been using it, how long you've been logged on at a time, how many years it's been since you've been using it. Those are all slightly different aspects of usage. And uh, another aspect of usage is activities. What kind of things do you do when you get online? So one of the basic distinctions between sort of information-based activities and community-based <coughs> activities. I go along and search and I find stuff, or I go along with an email or a post or whatever. Um, or another one is information versus entertainment. And there's an argument that if you spend more time doing information, in some cases communication activities, you're more likely to get those social capital benefits, and you're more likely to get the civic participation benefits. If you spend more time doing primarily entertainment or certain kinds of uh, Facebook activity, you don't gain those benefits even though you're using the system more. I know that none of you do that. None of you spend your time on Facebook chatting and idly playing. I know that. They told me that. So here are some of the predictors, of, and I'm not giving any of the actual tables or anything, but in 2000, which um, we'll see is a very interesting year with respect to mobile phones, what predicted whether people were even aware of the internet? And there was quite a percentage that was not aware. So at that time it was males, younger, more income, and white. And so those are the standard ways we think about the digital divide. We tend to think that you know, these people have more access, more use, and they benefit more from it. Adoption is slightly different. That is, once you control for awareness, age, of course, but an income, of course, and ed education is, is higher. It really matters more. Awareness doesn't really affect much of education. But notice that race and gender disappear. So the race and gender affect awareness, but once you control for awareness in terms of whether you adopt or not, even in 2000 in the U.S. it didn't matter. The gender divide had already disappeared in the U.S. with respect to computer-based internet use. That doesn't mean that it's the same with respect to tablet use or mobile phone use or chip implants, things like that. 
How about longer term versus recent? That is, people who have adopted longer ago as opposed to more recent, controlling for age. It matters, because if, if you've been using the internet for quite a while, you actually have a different understanding of the internet. You have different skills. You use the system in different ways. So if I just ask you if you've ever used the internet, and I don't control for when you started using it, and then also control for age, because if you're younger, you're obviously likely to have started using it more recently. What you find there is, is that, of course, um, age um, and education and wife, but also no children. You're more likely to, if you don't have children, you're more likely to have adopted it earlier on. <coughs> so those of you who want to make sure that you don't suffer from the digital divide, wait to have children. <laughs> or have them and then learn from them when they're seven. Now, if we sh jump ahead to uh, 2013, this is from the recent Pew study. This is just the means. These aren't controlling regression. You, yeah, I know you all take the methods classes. In regression, it controls for the shared variance among all the other factors. When you just test for means, it doesn't. So when you don't control for other things, we're back to whites, younger, more educated, higher income, and urban, suburban areas. So these are the factors that affect um, differences even in 2013. So even now, with respect to internet use, there are digital dots. Because these, the mean level of use or adoption, in this case adoption, are actually different between these categories and the others. One interesting thing, thing and I think, uh, I think, Jim, you were probably one of the first to really emphasize this, was uh, dropouts. And these are people who have adopted the internet in a given year, but in the next year they actually <laughs> stop using it. That might strike you as a little strange. I mean, the concept of, is there anybody here who used to use a mobile phone but now doesn't use a mobile phone? There might be one person, but we would be very interested in what that explanation would be. But over the years, from 1995 to 2000, and in other studies, there was like 8 to 10 percent of the people who realized, I'm really not interested. And among the older group in this most recent survey, it's the same thing. You ask them, well, okay, you're not using it. Why? Well, too difficult, I don't really need it, I'm not really interested, I tried it and it wasn't, there wasn't anything for me. Hard to imagine, but you have to respect each individual's motivations and choices and needs. So the kinds of reasons were uh, loss of physical access. So for instance, you don't have to worry about this, but for many kids, even now and certainly then, the only way they had access to computers were at school. So when they went home, they didn't have their computers anymore. So when they left school, they didn't have a computer. So they didn't use the internet anymore. Uh, complexity is always a difficult thing, and computers are still difficult. Now you have this nice, magical interface on your tablets and mobile phones, and you can use all the apps. You don't have to know what's underneath. But in the early computers, you had to know what was underneath. And before there was the visual interface of the browser, you actually had to type in commands to tell computers somewhere else to do something for you. You had to know a lot of stuff. Okay, so now we're going to shift to these uh, other countries. Now, what's interesting in these countries is um, there's very high awareness, but there's still quite low adoption and usage, which means there's a lot of other things going on. So in terms of awareness, again, if you're younger, if you're male, education, but if you're more in the city. Now, places like these countries, being in the city, and particularly being in the capital city, matters a lot. Because if you're in the rural areas, they were never developed during the Russian occupation. And they're often in the exact same situation condition they were, you know, 40 years ago. They're beginning to slowly change. And mobile phones matter because they're wireless and you don't need to put up the telephone lines. So that's changing. In terms of adoption, we still have a, a gender and economic well-being, which is the general sense of um, what the kind of things can you afford. Let me put this in context. What they found was that general SES measures like income make no sense in this country. Most people don't have a stable income. Rather, they try and measure what, uh, what can you afford. The basic bottom level is, I don't have enough money for food. And the second one is, I have money for food, but I don't have money for clothes. And that's, you know, you don't think about any of this. In these countries, 25% of the people say they don't have enough money for food. So these are really poor people. So economic conditions really matter. We also ask the same thing about not adopting, and economic, of course. They don't have the required equipment, the phone, the modem, the computer. 
that's why the mobile phone is really interesting, because the mobile phone, you just go buy or rent a mobile phone. You don't need all that other stuff. And the mobile phone's very easy to use, or it looks like it's easy to use. So what happens in these countries is you have very little computer-based internet adoption, and they adopt it much later than elsewhere, like in our country, but they do it through the mobile phone, through smartphones. And they have all these interesting arrangements for connecting to the wireless network. Um, in terms of the next thing of level, how much you use it. So here, 60% of the people never use the internet. Now remember about over 80% were aware of the internet, but most people don't use the internet, whether by mobile phone or by computer. So this is shocking to all of you. you were, as far as you're concerned, you were born with the internet and it's like in your bloodstream. But for a lot of people around the world, they've never used it. So only about 18% of the people use it daily. So there are some of you who use your mobile phone every minute, or sometimes mobile times in a minute. So there's a lot of low usage there, although we explained the variance uh, quite well. And these are the factors, again, economic well-being, more education, more openness, here's the language factor. In these countries, each of the countries have really bizarre, obscure languages with great histories. And so if you don't know English, you're not as likely to be able to use the internet. Um, these are factors, but they're less inf influential than for awareness of adoption. So the basic digital divide in these countries is whether you adopt or not, whether you have adopted or not. Once you've adopted, there are other factors that play a role, but the most important thing is how do we get people to adopt? Jim? Could you explain how you could possibly do a survey in a country where people don't have uh, phones and so forth? How are we able to get all this Face-to-face -face interviews. This, I, I have a whole section of that in the, on one of our pages. We have a, this study actually was published in Journal Communication last year, Katie Pierce and I. And the reviewers gave us a lot of grief. We have like 80, 82% response rate. And they say, well, how is that possible? And then they say, well, how could they answer if they don't mobile phone internet? They do face-to-face -face surveys. They go around the country. They stratify a three-level stratification. They visit households. And I ask Katie, who knows everything, and I said, how is this possible? I said, look, they do the surveys in February, so nobody's going nowhere. They're all in their house, and they have extended families, and they're perfectly happy to talk to somebody who comes by their house because they've got nothing else to do, and there's always somebody at home. And also, they're a very accommodating, very open culture. Yeah, it does seem strange, but, but that's another reason to do research in these kind of countries. You get a very different kind of a response to surveys, and these are typically done by what's called the... Uh, Caucasian barometer, and they run these nationally across these countries every year. Okay, so that's one study, and that's just basically what are the influences and how the influences change and how might they be different for different, uh, extremely different countries. So now we're going to look at what are the factors that predict internet adoption or digital divide, and what are the factors that affect mobile phone adoption or digital divide. And this is a paper that, that Jim and I do. What's interesting in the year 2000, I said this is an interesting year, in the year 2000, the adoption rate was almost exactly the same for mobile phones and the internet in the US. So it was a great year to compare the factors influencing them. So the basic results are for the internet, controlling for other influences, um, there was no effect by gender and race, but for mobile phone, there was income, work, and marital status. So if you're married, you're more likely to use the mobile phone. Um, in terms of veteran or recent, that is, did you adopt in the last couple of years or have you been using it for, you know, longer? Um, there are more factors for internet than mobile. What, what that means is that um, longer use um, is constrained or influenced by more factors with respect to the internet than the mobile phone. So the mobile phone is sort of more of a standalone device. There are fewer constraints on why you might actually adopt it. And there's cost factors, but with, it, with the PC or computer, there's many, many other factors that are involved in the mobile phone, so they show up here. In terms of dropouts, the internet, lower education, and mobile, lower income. Now, many of you have these contracts for your phones and your phone service. In general, ballpark, what does it cost you per year? It's like, how many would say it's 100 for all your data services, your phone, your contract? Less? 50? You all have them for free, your parents send them to you? <laughs> You've stolen them. Mine's still here. What's the number? 
points to, to even them. You give them, the Boston University gives you a free smartphone to show up, right? Isn't that right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a number. Um, yeah, okay. So I mean, the ballpark figure is 100. It can be lower, it depends on the data plan, the provider, the region, the discounts on phones. <laughs> okay. You apparently can afford 90 a month. I won't ask you how you get that money. Your secret is safe with me. But it's actually more expensive to buy mobile phones, although pricing is different. They're actually spending a lot of money relative to their cost of living and their income for mobile phones. And so income matters more for them than it does for you. And it's, of course, monthly a lot cheaper than a computer. But over a cost of span of a year, it's actually more expensive. But they can't think that way. So understanding the cultural background of these it helps a lot. So if we cross-categorize these, so here's the adoption rates, about the same, dropout rates about the same, neighbors about the same, veteran, recent, very, very similar. So we can, uh, well this just summarizes the research I just talked about. One of the things we can do is we can cross-categorize, because some people adopt both, and some people adopt neither, and some people use only a mobile phone, and some people use only the internet. So the question now is, are those differentially explained? That is, did they represent div different digital divides? And is having both more likely to decrease um, usage and, and information and activities? And so we can see the percentages here. 20% of the people in, in the year 2000 had neither mobile phone nor internet. In 2000, about 15% used only mobile phone, which is interesting. About a quarter used only internet, and 40% had both. So these are quite different numbers, and so it's interesting to see if we can explain them. So here are the significant highest influenced on these categories. And so if you're older, you're less likely to use either one of them. When my dad retired, and he had been international insurance executive, um, and he was in charge of systems, but not computer systems. One of the reasons that helped influence why he retired when he did, he said, all oh, these computers are coming in, and I'm not going to be around long enough to have learned all the stuff that I need to know, so now's a good time to get out. So when he retired, I have three brothers, and we didn't want to just give him something he wouldn't use, so I conspired to convince my brothers to, to join together, and we bought my dad and my mom a really nice computer. We each took our turns going out to the house and setting up and getting it to use. And mom said, Dad, I don't want to use the computer. This technology, he just, you know. Well, within a month, we were getting word processed letters from him, and he had cataloged his entire uh, Dixieland jazz collection of cassettes on some database at the time. So you just never know. In terms of the mobile phone, of course, if you make more phone calls, you use a mobile phone. But the factors that predict using both are if you have more income, if you have higher education, if you're more likely to work, and if you're more likely to be married. But underlying that, there's two interesting factors, and this is what's very interesting. Did something called multiple discriminant analysis, and you'll need to but what are the underlying factors that group all this stuff? The factors affecting internet only usage is lower income but higher education. And the main underlying factor for mobile phone is exactly the opposite. People had higher income, because those early smartphones are really expensive. We actually didn't have smartphones in 2000, and less education. So some people would argue that the mobile phone was a way for lower educated to get more education. And in fact, you need higher income to pay for them. So two opposing forces in the digital divide. OK, moving on to the next. So I'm just showing you some examples of kind of research. And each one of these different approaches uh, surfaces <laughs> different kinds of influences. When you're doing international studies on these demographics, do you only use people with carriers or people like in second world countries like Mexico, South America, you know, the Middle East, and you have know, North Africa, they use burner cells that don't have carriers, or you only go around carriers? Well, it's different, and Armenia is interesting, because here, up until recently, you had to buy your phone as part of a contract, so you sort of came with your phone. But in many of those countries, those two things are separate. You buy a phone, and then you buy a SIM card, and some people have multiple SIM cards for different carriers. And in other cases, like Armenia, they have all sorts of interesting, um, like they have a little flash drive that you can pop into your laptop and actually serve as your mobile phone. So we have to, we have to document each of those, which we do in our studies. But of course, 
if you're in an area that doesn't have a carrier, then they're not going to mobile phone. But maybe they'll have you know, a computer connection. Or in many areas that are really uh, low developed, they'll have basically one person called them um, mobile taxis. That people who had phones, they would wait at the curbside, and somebody would drive up and they would rent to use for three or four minutes, which was great because they only had a few reasons to call, they couldn't afford the phone. And they get a little small fee, and then they get the phone back to the person. And this is interesting pictures, people with the masks and stuff because the pollution is so bad by the road, and basically just renting the phone to people who can call it, just like a mobile phone. So there's all sorts of different ways of doing it. I mean, you asked a more specific question, but in fact, all those things are. OK, so now with smartphones, you can actually use your mobile phone to get on the internet. Remember in 2000, you could adopt a mobile phone and or you could adopt an internet, but you could only get on the internet using the computer. But now you can use smartphones. And these first time I saw my um, stepson and his wife use one of these, which was very early when they first came out, because I always buy the first of everything. They were in the back of the car, we were driving to the airport, and they were changing their reservations by moving their fingers around this device, which I'd never seen before. And it was no different than magic. I mean, you guys are totally used to it. But for the first people who use this as kind of interface, it's totally magic. You wave your hands around, and the world changes. OK, so what are the differences here? Well, in general, um, for adoption, there's many factors, but they're slightly different. So the factors that affect getting on the internet uses by computer are slightly different than those getting on by mobile phone. For the device, there are also many influences, but they're not as strong. That is, whether you adopt a smartphone for internet access or you use a computer for internet access. Of course, with a tablet, some of those distinctions are dis disappearing. Interestingly, once you have either one of these, it's not really a lot of, you may have differences in frequency of use, but it's not really affected by much. So once you've got the device, um, there's not much of a divide. And in terms of how long you use it, there's almost no divide. So device matters a little bit. Now in terms of activities, there are standard measures of activities, and there are differences, and there are differences between the kind of activities you use on the computer and the kind of activities you use on a mobile phone. And how many activities you use called activity breadth is also a factor. Well, one of the reasons this is interesting is the mobile internet can replace or leapfrog a computer in places with no telephone lines, there's no infrastructure, or where computers are expensive or difficult. <coughs> mobile phone is a way to start getting access to the internet, but there are many other factors. So one of the questions here is, does the device matter, and also what kind of factors influence activities? So one of the things in the literature about media is what we call affordances or features. And the mobile phone, of course, is very different from the computer. Here's some of the things that matter. And one of the things I didn't put here um, is that, you know, the phone is mobile. It goes with you. Unless you have a laptop or a tablet, it doesn't, it doesn't go with you. So these two devices, while you might think of them as just access technologies to the internet, they have different characteristics and different features. And that's, in effect, the kind of stuff you can do and who's going to learn what. It takes a high technological literacy, people aren't going to use it as much. So the, there's an interesting literature on, like I said before, online activities and what are the basic dimensions. So information, entertainment, this is one, or information and communication is another. And these might have differential influences on social capital. You spend all, play all the time, spend all the time playing a single shooter video game by yourself one would argue that that's not going to generate a lot of social capital. But paradoxically, you play one of the massive, massive multiplayer games and develop relationships with your team, that could actually generate interesting social capital, people that you actually meet up with and you go to conferences with, and sometimes these are among people who already know each other anyway. Okay, so we go back to Armenia, and what's interesting here is that it's a place where we actually have people who use both because of the, the point that you mentioned. So here's an example of what's in the service is called orange, so little flash drive is orange. And that's actually a way to um, <coughs> use your phone to connect to the internet. And you can see that 16% access the internet by the mobile phone, of these 420, 
Um, a high number do, and most of these are at work. People tend not to have computers at home, but they at work. And 13% use both. Uh, closing in here on finishing. So uh, what are the influences? Well, the standard demographic ones. The device matters a little bit. If you are, um, have lower income here in Armenia, you're more likely to use a mobile phone. But if you're older, you're more likely to use a computer. So young people who have more money are more likely to use a mobile phone. And we actually have all the cost figures for what it costs to get a phone and service. And it's pretty expensive. But there are people who spend a lot of money so that they can have a mobile phone, a smartphone. Part of its status, part of it's the only way they can connect. How about usage? Um, younger people do it, people who are in better economic condition. Device doesn't matter. So there's not a digital divide according to device by just simply using the system. There is on adoption and there is on activities. Here's a breakdown of different kinds of activities by those who use the mobile only, the computer only, or both. And I won't go into too much, but for instance, social networking <coughs> system, very high for those who use a mobile phone only. Not so high for use personal computer. And if you go here, something like um, email, it's about equal, work-related, primarily computer. So if you only have a mobile phone, you might be disadvantaged in terms of work. You might not be able to get a job, or you might not be able to do your work unless you know how to use a computer. That has a pretty clear consequence. Um, let's just look at an example. This is just one of the activities. This is using search engines. How many people here have done a search today? Did anybody find something really cool? What's, up, what's something that you found you thought was really interesting? Didn't find anything cool or you weren't looking for anything cool? Did we find like a great cat video or answer to our exam question? Nobody found anything really interesting. I want to know, because I'm not being able to search now, and I need to vicariously enjoy the results of searches. What did you find? Yeah? Uh, I found out which countries are the main source of immigration. Immigration is normal. OK, and, and why? I'm preparing a lecture for my class. There you go. Scandinavian countries are very interesting. They actually invest an awful lot in telecommunications and development. There's a lot of projects in Africa that are funded by uh, Finland, Sweden, and Norway. Anybody else? Somebody else had a bunch of... Yeah, I found out the guy who voiced the Tootsie Pop owl invented the artificial human heart. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, we know, and that guy was very famous. What's his name? What's the guy's name? The heart? Um, very famous guy. Um, yeah. That's all right. It's not a test. It's more important to know the voiceover of the Tootsie Roll. Winchell. Oh, okay. So maybe uh, the other guys sort of uh, figure out how to actually implant them as opposed to devices. But anyway, here's one kind of, here's an example of a kind of analysis you can do. What are the factors that influence whether you use search engines or not? Now, search engines are very important. We just found out two, three, actually, very interesting things. If you have English skills, you're more likely to use search engines because the search engines are, of course, in English, right? So if you don't have good English skills in those countries, even though you have access to the internet, you're going to be on the wrong end of the digital divide. You're not going to have access to knowledge. If you use a personal computer in an urban setting, you're more likely to do search. If you're older and use a computer, if you have more education but you use the mobile, you're more likely to use search engines. And if you're in an urban area or if you're a computer. So these are all factors that go together. So if there are differential benefits from using search engines, which clearly they are, because now you can use the Tootsie Roll Pop uh, thing in the next uh, you know, party you go to and really impress people or make them wonder. Um, but to find out the other kinds of facts, they're going to be a disadvantage and they're influenced by these kinds of things. So there are digital divides. <laughs> And finally, in terms of the number of activities, English, less use of mobile phone, more use of internet in general. So the mobile phone suppresses some kinds of things. Here's the last of the series of studies. OK, very quickly, I'll really only get a couple, a couple of points. So you've seen the digital divide model. You've seen how it's been extended over time. Well, there's another really powerful uh, theoretical approach it's called diffusion of innovation. And I studied with Edward Rogers, who was at Stanford when I was a graduate student. 
and I've written some stuff, and then his, his book, Diffusion Innovation, is very influential. And he makes a slightly different argument why people adopt things. So for instance, um, he, they look at what affects the rate at which things are adopted and who adopts earlier. So there's micro-influences and macro-influences. And here's something, so if you take any course that talks about diffusion innovations, you will have seen this graph. You may not remember it, but you actually have seen it. And the concept here is, is that for most innovations, there's this kind of curve. There's the innovators, the very early adopters, and they're very typical for most of us. There's the early adopters, some of the early people adopt, and they tend to have more education, tend to, you know, all sorts of characteristics. The early majority, the people who then begin to, you know, the market takes off, adoption really takes off, the late majority will eventually adopt as long as everything's been standardized, the price is down, they can trust the company, and the laggards may never adopt, and they're really resistant to change. You can add this if you have the data, which we do. We have adoption data for every year in Armenia. That's why Armenia is interesting because it's very difficult. To have. You can't really go back and get that kind of data from the US. You have early years, but not, not very early. And then we also look at some national things. So for instance, market entries, new service providers. This goes back to your question. Uh, bandwidth, also uh, GDP, the actual sort of economic condition of the country, which really dropped in the economic crisis. So here's a picture, and these are two different usage um, adoption rates, but here's the data we have. And for each one of these was a major market entry, and you can see that usage rose to some extent. And then here's the percentage adoption. So how do you explain that curve? That's the basic point. So we added on the diffusion approach to the digital divide approach by breaking out the years into these categories. So we grouped these four years as early adopters, these two years as early majority, these three years as late majority, and these last two years as laggards. And then we went to see what would it predict controlling for this. What well, turns out, I won't get into too many details. Um, so there was an effect by adopter category. We did multi-level modeling. I don't want to get into that. There was also an effect by year because, of course, over years, more people are adopting. There was also an effect of market entrant, but not for all the market entrants. It depended on price and technology. Just another entrant who was just competing with the others really didn't make that much of a difference. And then all these standard <coughs> demographics as well. So what we found there was, okay, you can also add adoption category as well as these sort of more macro factors. So, the summary is we've extended the digital divide model. We didn't study into everything. There are some other factors, but basically, um, digital inequality identified. What are some new influences? Often contextual, national, cultural. By device, there's influence by device. By the kinds of uses and activities that you engage in. And other more macro things like telecommunications policy, economic situation. So we're beginning to have a quite extended model of the digital divide. And so here's what we find in the, the things that we didn't talk here about the things that are in italics. So there's some research on skills. Esther Hargitay is well known for doing this kind of stuff. Um, we aren't looking at consequences. Obviously, if you believe in the social capital argument, and you could see whether there are different benefits or negatives for people using mostly mobile phones versus mostly PCs, computers. And then feedback. The argument is if these gaps are widening, like the knowledge gap, which I know that you heard about today. People who adopt earlier because of these early factors gain more benefits earlier, and so they actually end up having more income and more education, more success, and that just actually expands inequality in society. So the implication is access is not enough. People actually have to adopt. There are factors constraining it. There still will be uh, dropouts. Um, there is an uh, activity device gap, and there's some trade-offs between activity and activity breadth, access and frequency. There's a variety of outcomes that you have to look at. And so in, ve in general, when you do this kind of research, or when you make any policy prescriptions in the digital divide area, you need to take account of some of these things. We found some things don't matter anymore. Other things still matter, even though you thought they might have disappeared. There's some references, and I have that slide available because I know you want to read more about this. <laughs> These are just the things we've done. There's a zillion books and articles in the field. There you go. So we went across the digital divide.
They don't need to ask questions, they just search for it. There's a question right here. What do you do with the stuff that you study? Like, are you giving it to like HP or some company to make like cheap laptops for a term in um, they, there may be people in those companies who read my research, I sort of doubt it, but it has relevance, for instance, Katie works a lot with government agencies on, because they want people to get out of their poor economic education situation. How can they help do that? So they might just give them all mobile phones, but if it turns out that they use it mostly for playing games, they're not going to gain so much benefit. And so that might have an implication either for how you design, what sites you make available, or if you give mobile phones, smartphones to people, and they don't have English language skills, you might think, oh, it's just the internet, they'll find what they want. They won't, right? So it can inform the kind of activities and the money that you invest in these kinds of things. Um, there are training, all sorts of training programs, the universal service program, which is now shows up in terms of funding to internet. They could say, well, you know, it's going to be more important to put it in the, in the rural areas than urban, because that's like a big gap. So you could go through and, and discuss those. This is, I didn't spend much time because this is just the slightest possible. This one here? Or this one? This one? centralize the communications, telecommunications, and allows them to subsidize. But on the other hand, puts constraints on market entry, so they tend to have fewer innovations. Here in the US, we want innovations, people to do whatever they want, and we don't really care so much about the consequences. So this kind of this trade-off. So one response would be, look at the context that you're in, and see which one you can actually have more leverage on. In the US, you have almost a leverage on policy. In some South American countries, you have a place like that. Policy really makes a huge difference. So you could um, say to a market maker, for instance, in Armenia was covered by the national PTT, and then the first entrant came in, it took off, but that was just a reformulation of the Armenian service. So it wasn't until three or four years later they allowed the first commercial entrant. And that was a big, huge political debate because then the government doesn't control you know, <coughs> a lot about that. But they put standards and say, you got to meet the standards. That next entry came in was the first commercial one, and then adopted the ball. But then people were also doing things. So that's a fundamental debate in every policy issue. How much do you want to control, but also how much benefit you want to manage? We have time for one more question. All right. Oh, we got one. Can I, can, go ahead. You had your hand. Right. It's the most modestly assembled <laughs> stuff. I want to give due <laughs> respect to that. very interesting. Um, so a lot of countries never had the money to build the infrastructure and when they started putting phones in the locals would cut down the wires because the copper wires are actually worth quite a lot to people with no money at all. And it's very difficult to maintain physical infrastructure, particularly in a lot of developing countries. The countryside and the elements are really difficult. It's very expensive. 
And so now you can go right to wires. Well, you still have to have the cells. You still have to have coverage. And so one place might be there's not enough power to have cell towers, but you could have basically a small transmitter in a drone and just fly around. And when the drone's available, you can make your cell phones. And if the drone gets shot down or stolen or goes back home, then you can't call during that time. But it's better than nothing, and if you know it. Now there are cultural factors, which is we have all these attitudes about drones, and so you might say, well, there's a mobile phone there, but it's put up by the government, and now they're spying on me, so I actually don't want to use my mobile phone. <laughs> right? And so you have to figure that out, too. In terms of technology, uh, countries have very different policies on what kinds of technologies, who is introducing it, and what are the benefits. So with development, one of the technologies is agriculture. That's a very, very common <laughs> fertilization, seeds, planting, the kind of devices, terrain, that's all technology. And development agencies try and help countries develop these technologies. A lot of countries figure that technology, either industrial manufacturing or now IT, is really the way to go because it doesn't have as many material resource needs. But then you get trapped into using devices and standards <laughs> and materials from large international telecommunication companies and some countries find themselves down the road not so happy about that. So India, for instance, decided a long time ago to have their own computer industry so they wouldn't be taken over by IBM. Now that there's so many computers around, they finally you know, got rid of that policy. So very interesting area if you're interested in policy and social effects, telecommunications development is a great area, particularly for communication, because telecommunications is the most influential factor in generating uh, growth in income in countries. Small businesses primarily, but also farmers. Finding out information, having a more informed marketplace, getting help. Let me thank uh, Dr. Rice.